I'm Katie Roaring. And I'm Eric Roaring. And we're the founders of Fontana Candle Co. In four years, we took our hobby of making candles in our basement and selling them at craft shows and makers markets, and we turned Fontana into a nationally recognized e-commerce brand. This year, we are doing seven figures of revenue and have nine employees. So how did we do it? Welcome to the Candle Couple Podcast, where we will share the nitty-gritty of scaling our e-commerce brand quickly. We are spilling the tea, so hopefully we can help you scale your brand quickly, too. Episode number one of our podcast. Episode one. So this was really your idea, just like the candle business was your idea. So why are we starting this podcast? Basically, I think we have a lot of information that we can share we have we've gone through a lot of trials and and pain and blood sweat and tears tears growing our candle company and we've had a lot of friends who started candle companies we've had a lot of friends start other maker companies and they are going through the same struggles that we went through and we wanted to use our experiences to help others grow to the barriers of entry right now for e-commerce brands are so low and that's the amazing part anybody can start an e-commerce company but i think it's the scaling it that's really where you know a lot of people get stuck a lot of people you know get frustrated they quit i mean what's what's the stats like 90 percent of startups go out of business in five years yeah and we don't fortunately don't we don't know too many people that have gone out of business but most of the people we know have not gone. They stall. They stall. They have they are at year one still. You know, they're still at their makers markets and not doing a terrible amount of volume online. So what did, what did we do differently to just scale rapidly? I guess that's what we really want to dive into on this podcast. Right. This isn't going to be a podcast about how to make candles. No. There's... A hundred thousand YouTube videos on how to make candles and everything else. So that's how you learned that. YouTube. I did. Yep, I YouTubed a lot, and then also did one hundred and fifty different formulations of our of our candle to figure out what we had. But this is our story of how we've built our company from a hobby in our kitchen to now a one million dollar plus company, and have nine employees in four years and. All the blood, sweat, and tears we've gone through. I think so many podcasts, when they talk about growing the business, they skip all the details. They're like, oh yeah, we were in our kitchen, and then boom, we had 12 employees, and we were on QVC, and we did this and that, and you know, we're out now we're a $10 million brand, and they don't really tell you how they did it. Right, they kind of gloss over the really painful years of growth to, oh, we have VC funding, and now we're rich. Yes. How yes. did you do it? Yes. We don't have VC funding yet, and we're not rich yet, so you're still going to be doing this story with us. With us. <laughs> you're still along for the ride with us. Whatever. Yes. But, I mean, we do have a good grasp now of procurement, of manufacturing, of fulfillment. Yeah. I mean, that's how we were able to hit seven figures of revenue. Yeah. You need to have a decent grasp on operations. Yeah, and business. and you have to have a balance of the vision of of what the candle needs to look like and how to market it. But then you also have to have the operations of how do you scale the ops with that growing marketing? How do you manage cash flow? How do you increase your procurement? How do you increase your tech stack? And once again, all those lovely employees, and we do, we have love our team, but there comes HR. There comes HR. HR is a big part of our to-do list now. Yes. And it wasn't even a year ago, it wasn't. No. Not even a year ago. I think we've had an employee for 11 months now. Yes. So. So the business is always changing. As we grow rapidly, the business is always changing, and our to-do list is always changing, and we're always learning, but we will try to share the details of what we have learned to get to this point so far. Yeah, we really want you guys to learn from us and with us as we continue to grow. glean a lot of information from this podcast it's not specific to candles 
Yeah, I think that's a fair point because we may be talking about candles because that's our experience, but we've talked with people who have no product whatsoever. We've digital. talked digital product yeah, to people who make soaps, to people who make lip gloss, to people Merch. who make merchandising. Yep, yeah. exactly. Arts and crafts type of stuff of wall hanging items. Food. Food. Yep, all of it. Yep. And that's the best thing about being an e-commerce company. It doesn't really matter what you sell. Nope. Yeah, and I think it's almost like procurement. I did procurement for chocolate and cocoa and then switched into ceiling tiles and chemicals. I couldn't even say the names, but the fundamentals of how to buy something and negotiate a contract are very much the same. And it's kind of the same here of, okay, we do candles in an e-commerce business, but that doesn't mean it's totally different if you were doing cookies. Mm-hmm. We truly look at ourselves as business people and business owners. That's right. And we take our running the business very seriously. We want to work on our business and not just in our business. That's right. Yeah, we are very disciplined in our business approach with closing the books every month, setting budgets for everything we do. That book, um, The E Myth. I yep. read that for college for management degree. And that is what this is. You can't just work. In your business, we can't just be candle makers. We no. have to constantly be working on the business. You can, but you're probably not going to go anywhere beyond the hobby business then. Mm-hmm. Which well, Maybe a couple hundred thousand yep. at that point. Yep, which that's not a bad limit. <laughs> if you want to do that, sometimes there's days where it's, hey, let's just go back to that. <laughs> yes. I think now would be a good time to maybe talk a little bit about our background. Yep. Do you want to talk about Sure, yeah. So I alluded earlier I was in procurement. Uh, Before that I was an accountant so I got my degree in accounting in Spanish. Uh, Worked for Cargill Incorporated in their cocoa and chocolate division in Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Uh, Started as an accountant and really focused my accounting on the trading position. So uh, cocoa and chocolate used commodities and did hedging and I was in charge of reconciling the position and all the accounting that went with that. Fast forward a couple of years and I was able to start trading myself. I was able to be offered an opportunity to start, instead of counting money, making money and doing trading, which is really where I learned procurement and really learned about contract negotiation terms, um, how to utilize working capital, really got a holistic view of business in general, of working with plants, working with supply chains, working with logistics and that's really helped and translated into this business and helping us scale from, you know, buying containers of coconut oil off the shelf at the local grocery store to buying pallets of it at a time and having it delivered. So that's really helped with that. Um, My accounting background, I am able to close the books every month. I'm able to talk to our accountant in a financial acumen that um, he can relate to and we don't have to spend months reconciling P&Ls every month because I do that every month. That's a part of my job. You reconcile our books daily. Yeah, and daily. So I'll do a daily P&L and I actually do P&Ls based on every sale to understand margins. But that's also one of my strong su- strong suits and something I enjoy doing. You are our numbers guy. I'm the numbers guy. Okay, yep. that's why we're still in business. We are still in business because you are the numbers guy. Well, that, that, the financial piece of making sure our cash flow is solid, like, yeah. I would say that's why we're still in business. Yeah, and I would say to your side of it, though, is why we've been able to grow. So that yin and yang to business is really important, numbers. and I am not good at marketing. So what's your background? So my background, I am definitely an entrepreneur at heart. I never wanted to work corporate. I can't fathom working a nine-to-five. Have you worked corporate? temporarily for a bank in the mortgage department. I processed mortgages for maybe six months. Yeah. And they wanted to hire me on, but I just could not sit in that cubicle all day. It's hard. <laughs> not easy for me. Nope. So instead now I choose to work 24-7 for us. My favorite saying is it's just like um, Henry Ford and his cars. You can choose any color you want as long as it's black. You can work any hours you want if you're an entrepreneur, as long as it's all of them. That's pretty much it. Um, but no, I have a business management degree, and out of college, I tried a bunch of 
lots of different things trying to figure out what I wanted to do in business. And I did things like work at the mortgage department of the local bank. And that just, I had no passion for that. Um, so instead I went to a dog kennel and I, I worked at the dog daycare for a while. Really, really used my degree for that position. Uh, but I did meet um, a business partner, well, a friend who became a business partner, and we decided that we could run a dog kennel better than the one we were currently employed at. So we started our own dog daycare boarding grooming training center. So that was my life for a good three years. And that's where I, that's when I met you at that point after running that business for three years. But you were also a little hamstrung in that business and couldn't fully run it the way you thought it should be run. No. I mean, the partners, partnerships always work out until they don't work out. Yeah. And after about three years, that partnership. Because you and I butt heads a lot. And we're married. We do. <laughs> but that partnership had run its course. Yes. Uh, yeah. But you learned a lot from I doing did. it. Yeah. And I really learned in that business that marketing is my strong suit. Yeah. And I really didn't get to do as much marketing as I should have for that business because, again, I was too busy walking dogs all day. I was working in the business and not on the business. So I do feel like that's why that business, although it is successful, it's still in business, it's not where it could be. That goes back to our earlier comment of, if you just want a small business that's it's yours and you do it yourself versus trying to build it to a $50 million company. And my goal, I mean, was always to have five to ten locations. Right. So that business did stagnate, in my opinion. Right. Well, that's a fundamental direction of business on what do you want out of your business. Mm-hmm. I burned out. I gave my notice. And that was right about when we were getting married. Mm-hmm. And we always said we wanted to own a business together. We did, yeah. We, we always had that entrepreneurship passion. background. Yep. Yeah, we, yep. My dad owned his own business growing up, and he never worked for anybody. So entrepreneurship is in my blood as well. And I think that was something we very quickly bonded over. Oh, my gosh, yeah. When we were dating, we were always talking about business, business plans together, and opportunities. and. We but we never, ever thought we would own a candle business. Like, that wasn't even on the radar. That wasn't a thing at all. If you would have said to me that we would have a candle business, I would have said you're crazy. Yeah, because I actually wanted to invest in your dog daycare. Mm-hmm. That was turned down also. That was turned down. So, we never thought we would own a candle business, so how did we get into having a candle business? So that was, just like this podcast is your idea, the candle business was your idea too. Yeah. Well, so in 2017, we got a candle from a friend that was a big brand candle. That was for Christmas. Yep. We weren't big candle people, but... It's hard to say that now. It's embarrassing. It is embarrassing. We weren't candle people, but we lit it. And after about an hour, hour and a half, we had splitting headaches. We don't traditionally have headaches. And so we... Not at the same time. Not at the same time. No, exactly. And we were trying to figure out what changed in our environment that gave us these headaches and pretty quickly narrowed it down to the candle. We did a little bit of research on why that could be and found out really quickly how toxic traditional candles are. So sorry if you're a fan of traditional candles. They're about to break your heart. Yep. But they are full of hundreds to thousands of non-disclosed chemicals. Toxins. And so we did some research on them and found out that the fragrance and the paraffin wax are huge contributors to air pollution inside your home and said... I could do this better. I can make something better, something that's non-toxic and safe for our homes. Well, actually natural ingredients. Actually natural. Not just, I mean, they all say they're made with natural ingredients, but then they're really not. Right. They're, they're made with, yeah. not exclusively. That lovely marketing jargon. That's right. So we started doing some research on natural candles and narrowed natural it to ingredients. natural ingredients. That's where your procurement really came into play. Yep. And then my lack of chemistry really came in and that it took me 150 iterations of our blend to make our first candle that we gave away to friends and family as gifts. And it turned into a date night of, okay, let's every Thursday make some candles. And we gave them away and people started saying, yeah, these are really nice. I'd buy some of these. And I really thought this would be a fad. Yep. Because you do this. Yep. You get a new hobby and you go hard on this new hobby for a couple weeks. And then 
Dennis and then dies off. And I thought the candles were like everything, like drum racing. Do you remember drum racing? Vaguely, yeah. Piano playing. Yeah. yeah. Not candles. <laughs> Not candles. <laughs> yep. So we started giving more and more away for gifts. And as people, more and more people said that, hey, we'd buy these, we went to a maker's market and we sold $800 worth in our first show and thought it was, was it was a big deal. And so we just kept on going. We went to more and more shows and made more and more candles. And well, I, I need to back it up for a minute. So we did our first maker's market in March 2018, but we filed for our LLC in January 2018. So we actually filed for our LLC before we even attempted to sell one candle. Yeah, that's where our business comes in, though, and said we can't sell a candle without having a business, and we filed a business. Before. We official before we even knew if our mm. candles were any good. I think we owned three businesses before this that did nothing before, we so. We love to put businesses on paper. Yes. I think we have three or four of them still. Legal Zoom loves us. Legal Zoom loves us, yes. But that's our background of, well, we need to make sure we have insurance. We need to make sure we have our LLC set up. We need to make sure that we're personally protected before we sell a candle. And so that was just that background we had, and that's what we did. We did. And we did. More and more and more. And I would say we, we found our niche, and that's what really helped make us successful. So with all of that growth, how did we handle it? How did we prepare for it? How did we have our team set or lack of our team set for it? What kind of technology did we use? Tech stack. Tech stack. How did we prepare? So this is what we really want to talk through in this podcast of how did our procurement strategy change? How did our marketing strategy change? How did our fulfillment strategy change? How did our production change? Because the way we make candles today is not anywhere close to how we made candles back in 2018. And I am continually in my mind thinking about how we expand to make 100,000 candles next year versus 50,000 this year. Everything comes down to process. Everything, everything. Yep. everything. Katie is playing with her marketing budget next year of PPC versus influencer versus podcasting advertising. So how does that change and grow not only with our increased size of the company, but also an ever changing environment of advertising? There's a lot that goes into it. How do we solicit help? Who do we solicit help from? in areas that we aren't experts in and how do we recognize when we're not an expert in something? I think that's part of success too. We know immediately when we are not good at something and yep. we will ask for help. Yep. And that's a lot of a thing that you and I bicker about is that I'm hesitant to ask for help. I've always been hesitant to ask for, yeah, help. Ask for help. But that's where you and I balance each other out. And an important message of this is if you want to grow and as you grow, you make sure you have someone on your side that will fight you. You can't do this by yourself. No, you can't. You cannot do every task as you grow and scale. If you feel like you need to do every task yourself, you will not grow. Nope. There's only so many hours in the day. You need to know what you're good at. You need to focus on that and find people to fill in the rest. That's right. So... We plan on doing these podcasts every week and focusing on each one of our expertise in our business, what we failed at, what we succeeded at, how we overcame failures, what is it like to work with your spouse? how we've continued to grow and hopefully we'll continue to grow. So. Yeah.